Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the Boxing Podcast. We are sponsored by 32 Red. I'm your host, Ev Sarni, and with me is a man who would never shy away from a fight on the cobbles. It is, of course, Mr. Steve Lillis. <laughs> oh, well, we're at the Peacock Gym, Dev, and there's uh, plenty of people around here who won't shy from a <laughs> fight on the cobbles. I'm not sure if I'm um, among that illustrious list quite yet. Well, let me ask you, have you actually ever had a fight on the cobbles, Steve? The last time I had a fight on the cobbles, I thought, oh, I'm not going to go into it, but I ended up out cold for about four minutes. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, okay. Long well, time ago. Yeah, well, let, let's not let's not go into that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm being out cold. Let's not go into it. This week, we have got a former lineal heavyweight world champion in Hasim Rackman. We've got perhaps a future lineal heavyweight world champion in Daniel Dubois. We've got the man looking to end Daniel Dubois' dreams, Razvan Kajanu. That's this Friday at the Royal Albert Hall. And we've got another boxer featuring on this show, unbeaten super bantamweight Lucian Reed. So keep us in your ears for the next hour or so. And we promise we won't leave you out cold. It's the Boxing Podcast. This Friday night at London's iconic Royal Albert Hall, Young heavyweight sensation Daniel Dubois aims to move to 10-0 against Californian-based Romanian Razvan Kajanu. After giving a soundbite after soundbite last week, talking about how he'd, you know, he wants to fight with Chisora and all sorts of stuff, Steve Lillis caught up with Triple D at this week's media workout here at the Peacock Gym. Thanks for joining us, Daniel, on the Boxing Podcast. When we last spoke, you said you were going to start following boxing. Have you started following boxing? Uh... I'll check out all the big fights, I guess that counts. <laughs> I was at Christian Banks, James the Girl fight, so I guess that was qualified. Did you enjoy that fight? Yeah, it was a good fight. It was a good, good show as well. And this week, we've got a good test, Razvan Kajanu. What do you expect him to happen in the fight? Uh, work the fight, you know. I don't, I don't really um, have like a um, sort of set plan of fights can change at any given second so we're just prepared and ready to do whatever we have to do. Nathan Gorman's been making a lot of noise about the fight and fighting you. Do you, do you have a bite to that at all? Um, no, not really. It's um, boxing so I don't get, I don't get, no, thrown over or ramp, I ramp up about stuff like that. It's boxing, this is what the business we but do you have any emotion when he says he's going to knock you out and he just wants to get you in the ring and you and Martin are running away? You, what, you must have some emotions to, about that, for underneath the ex, you know, exterior. No, no, none at all really. We, we, have, we have to wait and see. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, we've got to wait and see. I'm, I'm, I'm relish that fight and I'll take him on any time. But, you know, you know there's, there's a date on it now, so we can look forward to that. You mean Frank's talking about this year. Do you, do you want it to happen this year now? Uh, definitely. If he can make it, it's uh, definitely. And what will happen? A knockout win for me. Will it be a knockout win against Kajanu because Nathan fouled there to do that? I'm not going to go on um, predicting what happens. Like, the fight's only a couple of days away. I'm in mo fight mode now and I just want to get on. What do you like when you're in fight mode? You know, you're quite a serious person anyway. Do you just go home and live, you know, replay the fight through your mind? Yeah, yeah, weeks, weeks, weeks before I have. So I'm sort of in that tight mind, mind frame anyway, so, yeah. And when it gets to Saturday, the day after the fight, how do you relax for a couple of days? So I know you, you do love the gym and you live boxing. Yeah. How do you unwind? Just um, staying at home with my family, they, they sort of ease the attention from me, so I just like to be at home with my brother, I have a six-year-old brother, all my brothers and sisters, I like to be at home and just chill with my family. Do you have a Saturday night out with friends or family at all? We might, we might go out for a meal, we're very spontaneous. And I understand you're going to America to spar Jarrell Miller. That should be a fantastic experience, won't it? Yeah, very. Um, I really I can't wait to get out there. I think it's um, um, a long time coming. Uh, now there's an opportunity. I don't want to let it pass. But what's the plan? Is it to have a couple of weeks there, a month? I know they want you there for a month, don't they? That's, um, to be honest, I don't know the full ins and outs of what the whole situation. I'm just glad to be getting out there. And, Hopefully doing some rounds with draw and a few other heavyweights what they've got. Does it mean a lot to you when fighters want you in to, to, to spar for some, to prepare for Joshua? You know, is that, you know, because of your size and how good you are. Um, I mean, Jarrell said a lot of good things about you. 
Um, yeah, it's very, very, very um, confidence boosting to earn them say these things. Um, it adds to my um, my profile and my image as well. So I, I can't say no. Did you meet Jarrell when he was over here? Did no. you have a chat at all on the phone or anything? No, I didn't. I didn't meet Jarrell. He was only over for a few days, and he didn't. He didn't come down to the gym. So you know, we'll see when we're out there. I mean, what's interesting about you with your trainer, Martin Bowers, he takes you around sparring. You've been up to, to spa with the yeah. Furies. You, you're going out to Jarrell Miller. You've had Marius back over. Is there anyone else you've been sparring with him on or know about? Uh, well, to be honest, it hasn't really been as busy as when I started my whole career. I was, uh, I was everywhere when I started. I was Brighton, uh, Manchester, Bolton. I was all over the country. But now it's sort of slowed down. But it's not everyone wants to spy you anymore, so you have to just take what you can. Yeah, so when Jarrell Miller come calling, it was an easy decision. Yeah, absolutely. Rep, rep that up, I can't wait. Well, when you go into the camp with someone like Miller, they just tell you to be yourself, or they try to get you to replicate Joshua for so many rounds? I don't think they want to want me to replicate Joshua. I've, I've got my own style, and they'll probably help me. Being out there will help me develop my style even more. And you'll come back a better fighter? Absolutely. Well, Steve, he's getting better at this. I like that he said he would knock out Nathan Gorman. I've not heard him be that kind of forthright about it before, Daniel Dubois. Well, in the interview there, Dev, he said he doesn't get under my skin, mm. but in the next breath, he said I'll knock him out. Now, Nathan Gorman has been doing, let's be fair, all the taunting, all the goading in the build-up to the inevitable clash. Frank Warren has said... Forget forget fighting for world titles in 18 months, which is something I've suggested. You two boys are going to fight this year. Love so it. they both know the fight is on this year. It's on as long as they both, you know, remain unbeaten. So Dubois, for all the saying, he's not getting to me. For him to turn around and say, I'm going to knock out Nathan Gorman is some statement. And because if you're not familiar with Daniel Dubois, he doesn't get involved in trash talking with fighters or anything. No. You, you, or anything like that. I've seen him once before and known him for a, more than a couple of years now where he's shown a bit of an edge and that was before the fight against Tom Little at the press conference at the Landmark Hotel a couple of days before, Deb, which you were there. Yeah. And um, Tom Little made a remark about Dubois just doing what his dad told him. And he yeah. said, do not bring my, my dad into it. And that's the only time of us in show an edge until today. But this was just warning a fighter to, to Tom Little what not to say. This time... He's told um, Nathan Gorman what's going to happen when they fight this year. Let's get it on then, I say. I love it. And I, I love Frank saying that he's going to make that fight this year. Everyone, everyone just thinks, oh, we won't put them in together. He's actually saying he's going to do it. So excitement for us. We win. The fans win from that. And Gorman's going to be there on Friday night, by the way. So Daniel Dubois fighting Razvan Kajanu this Friday night. BT Sport, Royal Albert Hall. Nathan Gorman will be ringside. I'm sure they're going to be interviewing him in between rounds. If it, if it goes more than a round, I'm sure Dubois will in, try to ensure that there will be no interviewing in between rounds because there's only going to be one round. But <laughs> we'll see about that. What about the um, what about the sparring with Big Baby Miller for Dubois? What do you think of that, Steve? What he's getting in this sparring with Jerome Miller is invaluable education. It's like his last fight with Kevin Johnson, invaluable education. This fight against Kajanu, another invaluable education. It's all learning and they're not traveling around the country as much now, Daniel Dubois and his trainer, Martin Bowers. But, you know, a year or so ago, they were driving up to Bolton for the day just to get rounds with Huey Fury and Tyson Fury. He's learning on the job in the ring and he's learning by going to America. And that is going to be one hell of an experience from him. It's just, um, I know they're waiting to finalize the dates and... Miller wants him there for a month, but I think Martin's only keen on it being two weeks. But that's going to be an invaluable experience, you know, not just learning in it, but maybe bits from Miller, but being around you know, the environment of a world championship camp. You know, it's sort of stuff you learn, you know, and he'll, he'll pick up little things from how what Miller does that he doesn't think he's right. Well, I'm not going to do that. And there'll be things you'll learn from Miller. Fantastic experience for him. And any heavyweight in the world would jump at that chance to go in that camp for a month. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? It, it feels like because he's, he's sparring Miller this time. He's got, he sparred Povetkin before as well. He's been sparring Marius Wack. He's, he's had, shared the ring, of course, with Tyson Fury. They did a bit of sparring. Huey Fury, Anthony Joshua. It feels as though if there was a template to create the perfect heavyweight, this is kind of it. And this is what's being followed here. He's had the rounds against Kevin Johnson. OK, he didn't get him out of there, but maybe it meant more to get the rounds. It feels like everything is just being done 
right with Daniel Dubois. And it's it's going to be interesting to see how he gets on against big Razvan Kajanu on Friday night. Can he get the knockout? Can he do what Nathan Gorman didn't? Can he do what Joseph Parker didn't? Well, let's hear from Razvan Kajanu. And Steve asked him how his preparations were going. My preparation is going well. No complaints. I'm healthy, things good. And I'm here with my team. Yeah ready to perform on Friday. Now, I understand you live in California with your family, but you've moved your base to France for this fight? Yes, I, I pick up my team and I had to train with them. I train in France, in Monaco. And how long have you been in Monaco in camp? For how long have you been? Six weeks. Six weeks. We've been together and we train pretty hard. And what do you know about Daniel Dubois? I know about Daniel Dubois, it's, uh, first of all, it's a big and important prospect of the heavyweight division right now. Uh, it's pretty hot, how I like to say. He's a big, tall guy with an undefeated record, which, I mean, it's an amazing fight for me. Is it another chance for you after losing the fight to Nathan Gorman? Everything is a chance for everyone. I mean, uh, it's an important step on my career. And uh, I'm going to take advantage of this. Tell us your thoughts on the fight against Nathan Gorman, because you really frustrated him in there, didn't you? Actually, my, my reason didn't was I'm going in the ring to win, because I'm a fighter. That's my main thing. For that fight, to be honest with you, now should I say the reality? I mean, you was here by yourself, yeah. wasn't you? Yeah. Not really. It's a lot of story behind of that uh, that fight, and I think with other occasion I'm gonna talk with you about that. We need like at least half an hour. I think it will be better for to talk about that fight after this my next fight. But let's talk about the future, <laughs> about my fight with Daniel Dubois mm. on Friday. Yeah. Why are you going to win the fight against Daniel Dubois? Uh, I will be. I will be. Not gonna say, tell you, I will not gonna win the fight. That's my, that's my dream, and that's my, that I'm here for. That's my reason why I'm here for, and I'm gonna do anything in my power to win the fight. And if you win this fight, and suddenly you have a chance to fight any one of the big three heavyweights, Tyson Fury or the two champions, Deontay Wilder or Anthony Joshua, which one would you pick to fight? The champion. Always the champion. That's the that's the the best target ever. Who do you consider the champion? At this moment, at this point, the best Tyson Fury, in my opinion. All all three of them are are great. But after the last fight with uh, Deontay Wilder, I saw a different Tyson Fury. All the respect for that. Well, that was Razvan Kajanu clear that he's not really coming to the UK to lie down. Steve, what do you make of this fight then? What do you think the, what, what do you think was going to happen? I can see two. I can only see one winner. I suppose you expected me to say that. Mm. Daniel Dubois, although from talking to Razvan, he's in a much better place than he was before the Nathan Gorman fight. You know, last time he had Joe Pennington, he got a, a, a British corner. This time he's been to Monaco for his camp and spent six weeks with um, Hassan Undam Jakam's team who are over here on the same bill. So he's taking this fight seriously and he's coming here to win. You know, we, we, you know, be, you know, you wouldn't go to and spend six weeks in camp in France, leaving your family in California. I see two outcomes to the fight. One winner, that's going to be Daniel Dubois. I wouldn't be shocked if Kunjanu has got the sort of style that Daniel can take out quick. I see Daniel either taking him out quick or having a similarly frustrating evening just like Nathan Gorman did and come out of that fight a clear winner but having learned a lot but if he does win quick the impetus for the Gorman Dubois fight itself will certainly be swinging back in Dubois favour because lately there seems to be a big swell of opinion making Nathan Gorman the favourite and that's what makes that fight you know fantastic when it does happen. You know, people were changing their minds all the time. A big performance from Triple D at the Royal Albert Hall on Friday night, and you'll see him the favourite for that fight again. Yeah, absolutely. He's one of them. People are changing their mind every week, and they, they probably will. Right now, it does feel like it's a Gorman thing. All the comments are like, oh, Dubois is not going to fight Gorman. Gorman's, you know, he's too fast. Gorman's too seasoned for him, and et cetera, et cetera. But everyone will just change their mind if, and, if Daniel Dubois knocks out Razvan Kajanu in a round or two. 
Of course it will, but I'll tell you this. Going, I, you've excited me so much. Though. You, yourself mm. and Frank Warren this week and Daniel Dubois saying he's going to knock him out. Frank saying it's happening. You getting excited Ooh. about it. He's excited me. There is history between them from the amateur days. You know, there wasn't a fight or a row. They just didn't hit it off. Yeah, and there was there was the incident. Well, it wasn't, wasn't really, really an incident. A few months ago, they were both at a press conference. They were both on the same show, and they were asked to kind of um, share a picture together. There was no face-off, but there was a very awkward them two posing together with Frank in the middle, and Gorman seemed very relaxed. Dubois seemed very uptight. Um, so there's, there's something there. There's there's some kind of history there. Something's gone on, Steve. But let's let's not look past Razvan Kajanu. That's this Friday night. It's the Royal Albert Hall, and you're, you're, pick, you're picking a Dubois. Dubois win and uh, a Dubois Dubois win. Win. I tell you, I'm going. You know, I'm going. Um, you know, you, you know, two ways. I'm taking the easy option now. You should be putting me on the spot, which you're mm. going to in the follow up yeah. question. So I'm not going to let you put me on the spot. I'm going to go Dubois knockout. Woo! He said it. Well, we shall find out Friday night. BT Sports 7:30, Royal Albert Hall. Boxing's back, and Daniel Dubois is following in the footsteps of heavyweight legends. Frank Bruno's fought there. Lennox Lewis has fought there. Henry Cooper's fought there. It's Daniel Dubois' turn. Let's see how he gets on. Well, I told you at the top of the show, we've got a former lineal heavyweight world champion on the podcast this week. That is Hasim Rackman. He is part of Travis Reeves' team as they head into their fight with Anthony Yard at the Royal Albert Hall on Friday. Steve Lillis managed to grab a word and find out what Rackman knows about the beast from the East. Well, we know he's undefeated. He's strong. Uh, he don't know how to lose. Uh, but we come here to you know, introduce him to knowing how to lose. How long have you worked with Travis? Well, we've been together for, for, for years. We're from the same we from the same um, city. So we've been we've been just together like it's like we got like a family unit. So we've been together for for a decade. Can you tell us what these strengths? <laughs> he just he he know how to fight. He know how to fight, he know how to punch. So um I mean I don't wanna to say too much, but um we, we come here to fight. But everyone from Baltimore can have a fight, can't they? I mean, you already know. And just the heavyweight division now, well, how do you view it at the moment? Who is the best out there? Um, I think it's undecided. It's a, it's a three-headed monster. I think they need to fight um, to decide who's the best. I mean, you, you know, I can make a case for all, either three of them would be the best. So, you know, the only way to um, decide that is that they won't have to fight it out. What's your impression of Tyson Fury, first of all? Um, well, he can fight. He can fight. Um, he's not He's not um, the biggest puncher for a heavyweight champion, in my opinion. But he definitely can fight. He got charisma. Um, I think he would be, he'd be good carrying the heavyweight championship in the world. But um, I would love if he had a little more pop in it. Or, or if he, he might have the pop, he just don't, um, he just don't try for the knockout. If he went and got more knockouts, I think he would be um, suitable to carry the match with the heavyweight champion. And your opinion of Anthony Joshua? Anthony, um, he can punch. Uh, Anthony can punch. Anthony would be the prototypical heavyweight champion. Uh, you know, people want to see guys that, that knock people out. So when you got Anthony and Deontay, they knock people out. That's what the people want to see. What's your impression of Deontay Wilder? Um, I, he's a little wild and erratic at times, but he got that equalizer with that right hand. So, you know, I mean, Tyson Fury or, or Anthony Josh could be beating him every round, but I, I still think they could lose the fight when I go. It looks like Tyson Fury is going to have a few fights in America. How do you think the American public will take to Fury? Well, I mean, it, it depends on the fights. If he get in there and, uh, and knock people out, I think that they'll they'll gravitate towards him if he gets in there and um, go ten rounds with guys that he's supposed to knock out. I think they're gonna be turned off. So he's got to go and start um, discovering the pop, as you say. Yeah, you, you know you got to give people um, something they you know they want to see. They want to see knockouts in the heavyweight boxing. They want to see knockouts. Period. And before we let you go, we've got to ask you about your memories of that night when I was there in South Africa when you shocked the world and bang you knocked out Lennox Lewis. All I heard was ching 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 that's it all I heard was dollar sign. 
I couldn't I couldn't hear anything else. I couldn't fathom anything else. But you know, you know, um, they say it's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I just knew when I let that right hand go, that was a pot of gold. Nice little interview there with uh, The Rock, the former lineal heavyweight world champion, the man that knocked out Lennox Lewis, one of only two losses, I believe, in Lennox Lewis's career. How did you find him sort of being around him? A very cool, laid back guy. Really cool fella. I liked him a lot. There was nothing about him that would even suggest he's a, a former world heavyweight champion, WBC, IBF, IBO, and I think it was a lineal champion at the time. Yeah. A nice, cool guy. He was he was laid back for sure. Yeah, I think he's so laid back. He was pretty horizontal. Just kept himself to himself. And unless you recognised him, you you would never had him down as a former world heavyweight champion. I th- I think a lot of people didn't recognise him in there. Yeah, and I, I went to I, I introduced myself to to him and Travis Reeves. Not to say Hasim Rackham was uh, underwhelmed to meet me. Um, so yeah, he's he's very very chilled and laid back. That's I'm take I'm taking it as okay. He was just chilled rather than he's just was didn't care about who I was or anything like that but Travis Reeves that's the reason Hasim Rackman is here has he got a chance Steve hey look I spoke I, I haven't I'm gonna be honest I haven't seen him fight I mean there isn't a lot of um footage of him we had him on the podcast last week and what I do believe being having spoken to him and being around Hasim Rackman he has come here to win mm-hmm. that there's no no doubt about but what a big fight this is for for Anthony Yard. You know, they're on, you know, if, if what Frank Warren says is to be believed, which it is, um, the WBO are pretty much on the brink of um, ordering Sergei Kovalev to defend his WBO light heavyweight title against the Ilford boxer. So, you know, th- this is a fight, a potential banana skin that cannot be a slip up at all. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Reeves has come here very confident. Um, he was he was asking me, what what have the bookies got me as? You know, what are the odds on me? I, I bet they've made me the, the underdog and all that. And I showed him, I think he's like 16 to 1. And his jaw dropped. It really, really dropped. He could not believe it. Anthony Yard was, you know, he's a clear heavy favourite in this. The other thing is, they w- we've just been seeing them all in the ring at the public workout. So Anthony Yard's in the ring. He's doing all, all the pads that he does. It's all a load of fun. The ring's full of his camp and everyone's shouting lions in the camp. Austria Travis Reeves, what what he thought about that. And he said, we see guys like this all the time in the US. They're all hype and they're saying lions in the camp. I think they're puppies in the camp. So he's, he's, come, he's come here with all, all this brash American bravado that we see so often from these American fighters that come over. And he's not coming to lie down, Steve. I mean, there's a lot of confidence there. He hasn't. He, there is. And when I spoke to Hassim there, he was saying about, you know, as far as he's concerned, I said, you know, will it be an upset like you beating, beating Lennox Lewis? And Hassim said, well, I don't, we don't see it as, a, as an upset. This is just another day at the office where we're going to win. Well, clearly a fascinating character, Ruckman. Steve, you were actually there in South Africa for that big knockout. Hey, what a week that was. The whole, the whole week Dev, there on the outskirts of Johannesburg was just surreal, the stuff that went on, you know, going to the, the gyms in Johannesburg where the late Nick Durant had his gym where Ruckman trained. And nobody gave Ruckman a sniff apart from his own corner until a conversation I had a couple days before. If you remember, Dev Lennox Lewis left it really late to come into. The fight was in about in April 2001 mm-hmm. and Lennox arrived less than two weeks before the fight. Uh, Rackman had been in South Africa since m- end of March, had about three weeks. No big deal. Being in town 10, 12 days for a fight is fine. But Brackpan, where the fight was, was about 5,000 feet above sea level. So they say you either come three weeks before, like Rackman did, or you turn up the day before. Lewis had been making the movie Ocean's yeah. Eleven with Vladimir Klitschko. And um, the day before, and the Lewis camp that week, it was fractured. It, was, it wasn't the best atmosphere in it. And there was a lot of concern about Lennox coming in late. And they knew Rackman had got into shape. They knew Rackman was right. And... Um, I was chatting with Frank Maloney and somebody from the Lewis camp. And they told me they feared the worst for Lennox that night. Really? Because his preparation had been wrong. But there was such a loving around Lewis and this air of invincibility since, you know, he got the revenge over Oliver McCall from all of us in the press. It was a complete loving. And Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest, you know, we, we, we were blinded by Lennox. 
uh, we just didn't see defeat. And the day before, I had this conversation. And they admitted to me, all totally privately, they were fearing the worst that night. And the worst did happen. But it's worth pointing out, 10, 10, 11 months later, in the rematch in Las Vegas, what Lennox Lewis did to Hassim Rackman when he was right. But you know what? Hassim's enjoying life. Lennox is enjoying life. No harm done at the end of the day. Well, great insight there, Steve. Let's see if Hassim Rackman's protege, Travis Reeves, can channel his inner Rackman and pull off the upset on Friday night against Anthony Yard at the Royal Albert Hall. It would be a big upset. Former Team GB super bantamweight Lucian Reed also returns to action this Friday night at the Royal Albert Hall. Steve Lillis grabbed a word with the undefeated Reed, who's looking for a breakout year. What's this year about for you? Is it about getting in title contention or, or, rem- or staying busy? Staying busy, but I do need to get titles this year. So this year I'll be busy. Thanks to MTK, they've made me busy. Um, this year I'll be going for the British. Who do you think you could be matched again? I mean, it's vacant at the moment. Jazza Dickens is there. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think they could all put you in against Jazza the ball if you ask them or your management asked them? Um, possibly, because Jazza is managed by um, MTK. And uh, who else you look at it on the, on the horizon who's British who might who poses, you say, a threat to you? To be honest, I'm not actually looked because I am fully focused on Indy Sandra. Um, I am fully focused on this fella. So after this fight, um, once I come for this fight, that's when I will be looking at names because right now I have to get through this fight to be able to go for title con- contention. So that's the only person I'm looking at is uh, Friday. Can you give us a bit of insight about training under Adam Booth, what he's like? It's a question every fighter who's been under him um, is asked about the Dark Lord. No, it's, it's hard because it is so technical, but it's so hard at the same time. We graft, we graft so hard in gym, we have really hard spars. I spar Michael Connell on a regular basis and he's one of the fittest people out there. But technically, Adam Booth is unbelievable. Honestly, I've never seen a camp like it and I probably will never will. So that's why I need to stay with that camp no matter what. Does he shout the tour at you? No, nope, don't shout. He, he, I don't know, he's saying about him. He's like a really strict dad. Like he, He'll give you a look and you have to listen because you know that he knows what he's talking about. Like You trust your dad and you trust Adam with his boxing um, knowledge. So he's, I, I, I always say to him, he's like, he's like a strict dad to us. And for you boxing at the Royal Albert Hall, what would that be like? It's going to be unbelievable. No, I've never ever been and I've never seen it until um, I got told of boxing and I looked at a picture and I couldn't believe it. I boxed at the O2 a few times and it is... Uh, O2 is lovely, but the Royal Habit Hall is beautiful. So I'm looking forward to it. Steve, what do we think of Lucian Reed? Big chance for him on Friday night at the Royal Albert Hall. Good stage for it, and he seems excited about it too. He's excited about it. As you, as you, you know, has been mentioned, he's got to he's got to be busier. He says he's going to be busier. It's up to him now to do the talking in the ring. I think when you when you look at um, the pedigree he had as an amateur, if he doesn't go on and win a British title at worst he'll consider it um, a failure, his career. Yeah, you, uh, you'd think British title minimum, really. I mean, he's one of those that turned over from the GB system with, and he had a lot of fanfare around him. And you can tell when he does box, you can tell he's a talent. So um, hopefully he does, you know, put on a bit of a display. He, and he's surrounded by the likes of, you know, Josh Kelly and, and Mick Conn and all, all those guys at Adam Booth's gym. It's, it's only going to do good things for him, right? He's only got good fighters around him and a good trainer. And when you mentioned Mick Conlon, mm. you know, he's just improving and improving. You know, he's going for his 11th win on Box Nation on March 17th. Yes, talk me through it. So yeah. Box Nation have got Mick Conlon's next fight. Yeah, his first successive year, he celebrated St. Patrick's weekend by headlining at Madison Square Garden. Sunday, March 17th on Box Nation. He's up against Ruben Garcia Hernandez. And it seems that everything around Conlon is being geared up to a rematch with Vladimir Nikitin, who's also on that bill. He's, of course, the Russian who um, controversially beat Mick at the 2016 Rio Olympics, which led to that famous middle finger salute that really helped Conlon's career. I think Hernandez only lost three times and it's a good level. You know, he lost on points against Rafael Riviera and he retired I think after seven rounds when he fought um, Randy Caballero. What about this nicotine fella then that they're, they're lining up for a, a big fight with Conlon? Is is he any good? I know he won that. He Obviously he, he beat Conlon in the Olympics but it was controversial. How, how's he doing as a pro? He's been winning as a pro but yeah. you know let's be honest and Mick has said this to me himself and I think Bob Aaron would, would admit it. When top rank signed Vladimir Nikotin it was for one reason and that's to fight Michael Conlon and 
I wouldn't be surprised if you saw Conlon Nicotine when Conlon makes his annual appearance in Belfast later this year. I could see that fight going there. That's where it belongs. Mm, well, look forward to seeing that. I'm, I'm, it's always good to see Mick Conlon in action. So I, I will certainly be tuning in on St. Patrick's Day on Box Nation, another Mick Conlon headline show. Well, Steve, I have been sitting next to you for the last I don't know, half hour, 40 minutes, and I think that you've brought a rage with you to the Peacock Gym. I think it's that time of the week again where I ask you, what are you talking about, Lillis? I'm talking about someone who I'll get on so well with professionally. I'm a fan of his as a person and a bloke usually, but I've got to pull down Carl Frotch this week. <laughs> oh, you know you know where I'm coming here, I <laughs> yep. think, Dev, from yep. that little snigger. I'm looking here to my right and there's a snigger in your face <laughs> that says, is it Chunky the Gal? Yeah. yeah, you're right. It's Chunky the Gal. You know what? Frotch had a marvellous, marvellous career. 35 fights, 33 wins, two losses, one to Andre Wall at the peak, at the height of his powers, one to Mikhail Kessler that he avenged, you know, so technically only beaten once, if you want to say that. The rivalry with George Groves. Mm. And why has he dug out James the Gal when the Gal has ended a brilliant career? The first Britain to win Olympic gold and a world title, been in some great fights, rivalries, won world titles in America, been fantastically loyal man to his trainer, Jim McDonnell. And for Carl Frotch to turn around and say, yeah, he had a good career, good luck to him, <laughs> but I would have I would, I would bat hammered him. Oh, come on, Carl, oh, that is really <laughs> going below the belt. And, you know, you've done yourself no favours because, you know what, if people met Carl Frotch and knew him and met him in a bar, you'd think what a decent fella he is. But he comes out with these things where, he just lets himself down. And I think mm. that's a real black mark making that comment about De Gaulle because James De Gaulle had a fantastic career. No, he never really, for some reason, captured the public's love as much as he should have done. You know, there maybe he did an interview in the, in the News of the World when he turned pro and he used that term Marmite and mentioned, you know, since he won a gold medal, a couple of women he, he might have pulled and didn't do him, you know, that didn't go down too well. Then when he made his pro debut, he got in the ring in Birmingham on the same night Frankie Gavin, I think Billy Joe Saunders made yeah. their debut. And through there, he's vest into the crowd. He was the bad boy in the George Groves rivalry. But he still had, you know, a magnificent career. And any dealings I had with him were, were nothing short of, of really, really good. And, you know, to, to, I just thought what Carl did was just totally below the belt. It was a low blow, that, from, from Carl Froch. It really was. Even George Groves, who, if him and James DeGaulle saw each other in the street, one would cross the road, showed a bit of class and wished him all the best. Although he had been knocking him as well a bit. Um, after the Eubank loss. But he still come back and showed that bit of class. But Carl could have been a bit done a bit better there and, and, and not said what he may, he may have done to him had they boxed. Had they boxed, yeah, I've got to be honest, I would have fancied Carl to win the fight. But it doesn't mean, and so would most people, I think. But I don't think that means Carl should have come out and made that comment um, hours after he ended a golden career. Well, he did the same for George Groves, didn't he? It was the, the same kind of thing. And that led to his Twitter beef with Andre Ward, who was like, this guy's just a hater. He's, he's bitter. He's this and that. And then Frotch was going back and showing, I mean, he was posting pictures of the success that he had against Andre Ward in a fight that he lost. It was all a bit cringe. What What is it? Why is he doing it, Steve? Why? Why? I mean, before he's called, he called himself an international superstar and he, he drew sort of... That, that was quite hilarious at the time and in the face-to-face -face that he had with Andre Ward, I remember that. Andre Ward pulled him up on it and he said, y you're not supposed to sort of pat yourself on the back, you let other people do it. What What is this? Could it be that he feels as though he doesn't get the credit he deserves, Steve? You know what? That's quite possible, Dev. And does he get the credit he deserved? You think he went to America and beat Jermaine Taylor with seconds to go um, before the Super Six? He went into the Super 6. He had home advantage in his first fight against Andre Durrell. Mm -hmm. And everyone was saying he was lucky he didn't deserve that decision. I thought he just won the fight. It was a middle-of-the-night fight. But there's a lot of people saying he never deserved that. He thinks he deserves credit. Durrell did well in his career after that. So that that's going to make him feel a little bit angry. He was then taken 
into the away corner in Herning, Denmark, to fight Mikael Kessler. He was the away fighter. And then when he fought Kessler, he lost, he lost a close decision. I thought Kessler won the fight. He feels he won the fight, but he was the away fighter. Even in his, his third fight, when he performed fantastically to win the vacant WBC super middleweight title against Arthur Habram, mm -hmm. you know, it was in Finland, neutral territory, but the Sowlands who promote, who promote Abraham were the, were the promoters of note. Yeah. And then when he, he, he then fought a substitute, well, so got a late entrance to the competition, Glenn Johnson in Atlantic City. So he was in America again for his semi-final against Glenn Johnson. He pulled that win off the fight. And then he went into that Andre Ward fight in Atlantic City. And look, he was well beaten to me for me. But if you listen to Carl, he doesn't think he was well beaten in that fight. And from that, that, from that, that the results in that and the way that competition went, that might be one reason why he feels he didn't get the credit he deserved. And also the George Grove rivalry, the fight went to Wembley in front of 80 odd thousand people, as Carl keeps reminding people. <laughs> and Carl was the was the was the fans boo boy that night. Yeah, yeah, but, um, yeah. George Groves had a lot of backing, and there was the, the kind of feeling that there was a, an injustice from the first fight that it was stopped prematurely. So it does feel like there's always been this kind of scrutiny on Froch. So it'll be interesting to see what he says when, when someone else retires, Steve. What about yourself? When you finally retire, are you going to let Carl Froch say anything? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing for certain I won't let Carl Froch read the eulogy at my funeral. <laughs> Well, this episode has been a Peacock Gym special ahead of the Royal Albert Hall return on Friday night. Steve, let's have a closer look at some of the fights. Uh, I need your opinions. I, I need you to tell me Liam Williams versus Joe Mullender. Where's your head at? Liam Williams, I think Joe will, will make it tough like he does for anybody and everybody. And I think he'll push Liam for a long way. But ultimately, I see Liam pulling, pulling away in the second half of the fight and, and stopping him around rounds nine or ten. Mm, and what about Johnny Garton against Chris Jenkins, a British welterweight title clash? You know what? This has got WAR scribbled all over it. The only fear I've got is Chris's eyes that seem to, to, to bleed. And he has had a couple setbacks in cuts, one technical draw, one technical defeat. But if his eyes hold up, we have got 36 minutes of beautiful brutality. Oh. I still think Johnny Garton pulls it out and wins on points. I just think the impetus is with Johnny at the moment. He's, he's at a stage of his career where he has overachieved, but he's getting in the ring and he's, he's, he's more and more confident as a person. Yeah, he's got all the momentum, hasn't he, old Johnny Garton? And That's what about. Word. Yeah, exactly that. Daniel Dubois, Razvan Kajani, you've given me your prediction already. You say Dubois going to knock him out. Not changing your mind? End of the show? Not changing my mind. What I do now, it's going to be a great night at the Royal Albert Hall yeah. this weekend. And if you're not there, you've got to be watching it on BC Boxing. I've, I've, I've had a long-standing arrangement this weekend for about a year that I, I can't cancel. But the Friday night portion of it, uh, it down in Minehead has been cancelled because I'm finding somewhere with BT Sport. Yes, guaranteed. Yes, nice. Nicely done. And Anthony R. Travis Reeves, WBO Intercontinental Light Heavyweight title. Tell me about it. Big feeling Yard is going to turn up. Reeve is going to give it, give it a real go, but he's going to get banged out there quite in about four rounds and quite spectacularly. And then we might hear some news afterwards whether the WBO are going to order Kovalev against Anthony Yard. I hope so. I hope so. And obviously it's a, a, a super packed undercard as well. The likes of Lucian Reed, who we heard from earlier in the show, Jake Petit, undefeated middleweight banger Denzel Bentley, who we've had on the show in recent weeks, Hamza Shiraz, who, who whose fans are absolutely, oh, they're, they're crazy. They've got the best chant ever, which is Shiraz on fire, the other boxers terrified. So if you, if you, if you make it down to the Royal Albert Hall, <laughs> listen out for that. James Branch Jr., Horny, Harvey, Horn, Steve, who should we look out for? If, if you're actually at the Royal Albert Hall, is there someone that fans should be looking out for on the undercard? You know what? I'm a big fan of Denzel Bentley. I've seen him a couple of times and he bangs people out. I'm really excited for, you know, we haven't seen him in a hard fight yet. There's questions that have got to be answered, but he can whack this kid from Battersea. Mm. He's a real puncher. And if Shiraz's fans sing that, I, I want to be around that sooner yeah. rather than later. <laughs> I found myself on the cusp of joining in last time. I wasn't quite there. I wasn't quite there. there you know, maybe next time, but 
Maybe, maybe I will be joining in soon enough. And I'll tell you who I'm looking out for. James Branch Jr. Now, he, he's, he's a kid who's, who's turned pro. He's only had three fights. His dad was a boxer. He had, you know, he was touted to become a real star as a pro and it didn't quite work out for him. James Branch, he was looking a bit, let's say, heavier in, the, in his first few fights. Saw him today at the public workout and he's looking good and he's looking trim. And he says he's got a nutritionist in. He says he's learning stuff that he, he didn't even know about. He was eating too late. He was eating all the wrong sort of stuff. So um, I think we might see a, uh, a rejuvenated branch. What, what did you think seeing him today? Yeah, he, he looked sort of, a, he had a, a, a sort of a shine to his face that boxers mm. have one in there, which suggests he has prepared really well for this. It's his third or fourth outing. But you, you know what? With, 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 the, with this fella, he's got fantastic charisma. And they're yeah. the sort of guys you think, wow, if you can live up to the potential and expectation of everybody here at the Peacock Gym, it's going to be a fun ride with you. And I suspect that's the sort of career it's going to be. I'm not there saying he's going to, you know, burn up the world and go on like, but you know what? It's going to be, a, he's going to be in some fun fights, winning and losing, I think. Well, we look forward to seeing it another week, another belter of a show. Hope you've enjoyed it. We were here at the Peacock Gym. Remember to tweet us any comments at Steve Lillis, at Sony Dev, at The Boxing Pod. Come along and follow us. And um, Steve, any closing comments? Like you, you're looking at me like you like you want to say something. Go on, give me something. Get well soon, Frank Bruno. He's oh, a bit yeah. under the weather. He's had a bout of pneumonia. He's had to cancel some of his uh, dinner appearances and various things. He does charity fundraising. Does a lot of that. He's got. He's laid up about the pneumonia. We just want you back, Frank. Fighting fit soon and making us all smile again. Get well soon, champ. Well said, Steve. Well, Friday night, 7.30, BT Sport. Boxing's big return to Royal Albert Hall. Only the second show in 20 years to be at this iconic venue. I can't wait for it. Steve, you're not even going to be there, so you must be gutted. I'm going to be there. I'll be watching on TV, watching everything. Too I'm right. looking forward to seeing, I'm hoping Nathan Gorman is going to be on fire. We've ever had Shiraz on fire. Nathan's on fire. <laughs> Ooh, Boar is terrified. Ooh. Nathan's on fire. Well, I don't mean that that triple D, but we might be singing that, mightn't they? Well, uh, do you know what? I want Gorman to just go full on Tyson Fury against Wilder. I think, you know, that's it. Get in the ring, throw your shirt off, call him a big dosser, all of that. I want this beef. Let's hope it happens, eh, Steve? What do you reckon? Do you, do, what, what, what will happen if Nathan Gorman gets in that ring, charges the ring, squares up to Dubois, gives him a bit of what for? What's Dubois going to do? I don't think he'll do anything. I think Martin Bowser will pull him away and he'll do, <laughs> he won't do anything because it's just the way he is. He, he just, you know, it, him saying he's going to knock him out is serious stuff from him. He yeah. means it as well. It is. And we look forward to seeing what happens there. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. <laughs>